Our opening song will be 520. Will you all please stand? 520. He hideth my soul. Sing it up, young people. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there. Such a redeemer is mine. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love. Yeah. 
Father in heaven, we thank you for this day, Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would bless Brother Baker as he presents the message this morning, that we may receive it, retain it, and be able to reproduce it. Thank you, Father, for loving us so much. In Jesus' name, amen. There were three principal people who led in the founding of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The Seventh-day Adventist Church was founded in 1863. We've gone through the Millerite movement, and we've come to 1844, October 23rd, 1844. We talked about yesterday when Hiram Edson suddenly had this vision and saw that Christ went into the most holy place. Um, so the three principal people who were responsible for founding the Seventh-day Adventist Church were Joseph Bates, James White, and Ellen White. And so far, we've said almost nothing of them. The only one of them we've talked about is Joseph Bates, uh, in that James White gave the account of the camp meeting where Samuel Snow rode up on a horse came, talked to his sister, shared with him his understanding of the midnight cry. She interrupted the speaker, who was Joseph Bates. <clears throat> In James White's description of that meeting, he talked about how dull the speaker was and how boring it was. And, and so Samuel Snow's sister is saying, we don't need to hear these things that we've heard over and over and over again. Let somebody come and speak who has a message from the Lord. Man, what a rebuke that must have been, <laughs> Joseph Bates. Um, so anyhow, that's all we know of him so far. So uh, today, I want to start talking about Ellen Harmon. <clears throat> Ellen Harmon was... 16 years old in 1844. A young girl, like a lot of the young girls here with us today, um, like many of you, she was extremely shy. She had some pretty good reasons for that. Ellen and her twin sister Elizabeth were born to Eunice and Robert Harmon in Gorham, Maine, and she was born on November 27th, 1827. Uh, pictured on the upper right is uh, a picture of her father later in life. That's Robert Harmon. And that's a picture of the mill, which uh, still survives in Gorham, Maine. Um, the picture of the building there, that's, that's the street where Ellen White got hit in the face with a stone. Um, and it's, it's probably something that, well, it definitely affected her for the rest of her life. Because, um, you know, sometimes even little girls can disagree. So she's nine years old, apparently got into some sort of argument with another little girl. And, you know, there was some distance between them, and the girl said something to Ellen. Ellen turned around and took the stone right in her face. And so she was knocked out, and from that point, she was never able to go back to school. She was physically weak from then on. Um, so when she's 12, William Miller comes to Portland, Maine, and she went to hear him speak. And she was really convicted by his preaching. But 
even though she was convicted, she didn't have any peace. She didn't have a sense of freedom. I mean, she knew and believed that Jesus was coming. And uh, again, this is 1840, so they're looking at three years to the second coming. But she doesn't feel in any way ready for the second coming. So in that summer, in 1840, um, Methodists had a lot of camp meetings, and the camp meetings were attended by lots and lots of people. And uh, the picture there is a picture of an old Methodist camp meeting, and you see there's kind of a stand and a guy with both hands in the air as he's preaching. Um, they were very um, enthusiastic preachers and very emotional camp meetings. So um, she was very encouraged. The, there was a sermon from the book of Esther, and it talks about the point where Esther comes to, to the point where I'll go before the king, and, you know, if I die, I die. I'm just going to do it, you know? And the, the message is we need to go before God and not be afraid and make ourselves right with him. And the quote was... Um, Surrender to God and venture upon his mercy without delay. So she knelt and she prayed, and suddenly this awful burden that she had left her. Her heart was light. At first, a feeling of alarm came over her, and she said, I tried to resume my load of distress. It seemed to me that I had no right to feel joyous and happy. So she's got these conflicting feelings in her heart. Something had just changed in her life. And she's like, but what about all this guilt? Shouldn't I feel guilt? But she's feeling a sense of freedom and joy. Jesus seemed very near to me. I felt able to come to him with all my griefs, misfortunes, and trials, even as the needy ones came to him for relief when he was upon the earth. There is a surety in my heart that he understood my peculiar trials and sympathized with me. I can never forget this precious assurance of the pitying tenderness of Jesus toward one so unworthy of his notice. I learned more of the divine character of Christ in that short period when bowed among the praying ones than ever before. And then one of the, one of the women at the camp meeting comes up to her and said to her, dear child, have you found Jesus? And she said, I was about to answer yes, when she exclaimed, indeed you have. His peace is with you. I see it in your face. Now, in June of 1842, William Miller came again. And um, there was a lot of tension at that time between Miller and the leaders of the popular churches. So he was able to find a place, a church on Casco Street in Portland. And um, Ellen White was, or Ellen Harmon, was happy to attend the lectures. She said, I had fallen under discouragements. You know, a lot of times, a lot of times a young person has a conversion experience. And then, you know, life happens. And they're like, oh, I'm sad again. I wonder if I'm lost. Um, Ellen White, you know, felt those same kinds of feelings, that she felt discouraged, um, and so she didn't feel like she was ready to meet the Savior. So she said this second course created much more excitement in the city than did the first. And so on June 26, 1842, this is a year before they were expecting the second coming, um, Ellen, Ellen Harmon was baptized by the Methodist minister with 11 others. And she was still confused um, over justification and sanctification and felt that she had no assurance of acceptance by God. So her, her Christian experience waffled in, those, uh, in the beginning of her experience. So she shared this with her mother. And you know, of course, they're constantly confronted with all these newspapers talking about the nearness of the second coming. So her, her mother um, told her to go to talk with 
Levi Stockman, and even though they called him Elder Stockman, he was rather young. Um, and he told Ellen that God is not a tyrant. He is a loving father, and he simply wants his children to come to him in faith and trust him. He went on to say, go free, Ellen. Return to your home trusting in Jesus, for he will not withhold his love from any true seeker. He then prayed earnestly for me, and it seemed that God would certainly regard the prayer of his saint, even if my humble petitions were unheard. My mind was much relieved, and the wretched slavery of doubt and fear departed as I listened to the wise and tender counsel of this teacher in Israel. I left his presence comforted and encouraged. During the few minutes in which I received instruction from Elder Stockman, I had obtained more knowledge on the subject of God's love and pitying tenderness than from all the sermons and exhortations which I had, to which I had ever listened. Then in September of 1843, getting closer and closer to the second coming and this tension between the religious leaders and the Millerites was now at a, at a height and the Harmon family was expelled from the Methodist Church. That's the church in Portland where it now stands that uh, they were once members. Then we talked about the midnight cry message from Samuel Snow. In the summer of 1844, the midnight cry began to sound. Now with the midnight cry, they have a certain date. They know it's going to be October 22nd, 1844. So the whole movement is revived. And um, Ellen Harmon described in 1844 that that year was the happiest year of her life. My heart was full of glad expectation. I felt great pity and anxiety for those who were in discouragement and had no hope in Jesus. She made it a personal project to convert every one of her friends. We united as a people in earnest prayer for a true experience and the unmistakable evidence of our acceptance with God. As the expected day of the second coming approached, she and her family diligently searched their own hearts and humbly confessed. Later, she wrote, every morning we felt it was our first work to secure the evidence that our lives were right with God. We prayed with and for one another. The joys of our salvation were more necessary to us than our food or drink. I think we need that kind of experience today. We need to pray for one another. Amen. We need to pray earnestly that people are saved. <clears throat> the Harmon family was as disappointed as any of the Millerites when Jesus didn't come on October 22nd. Her brother, Robert, was 18 years old. She also had a sister, Sarah, 22. Robert and her twin sister, Elizabeth, both gave up their faith that Jesus was going to return. Ellen and her sister, Sarah, together with their parents, continued to hope that Jesus was coming. Shortly after her birthday in November, Ellen went to visit her friend Mrs. Haynes in December of 1844. So this is about seven weeks after the great disappointment. Small group gathered for prayer, hoping for light, trying to figure out what they didn't understand. Where had they gone wrong? And as they're praying, suddenly Ellen is transformed. She's taken off in vision. In her vision, she saw the bright light behind the people of God. You can see it in the picture. And that they're on this exalted um, pathway, which she saw high above the earth. And as she saw the people walking, she could see Jesus and the heavenly city in front of them and this bright light that was behind him. And she described the bright light as shining over the whole path and the angel that was with her said, that bright light is the midnight cry. 
everyone had wondered about that message of October 22nd, 1844. Were we mistaken again? Should we look for another date? And the angel is saying, no, that wasn't the end of your journey. That's the beginning. This was the message that the Advent people needed to hear. Let's bow our heads for a closing word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, my prayer is that you would inspire us with such a spirit of repentance, with such a faith, with such a hope, with such a burden on our hearts for our fellow brothers and sisters in the faith, that they also would be ready for Jesus and his second coming. Lord, I pray that this would not be just our past, but we would see it as our future, and that Jesus would draw near to us as he drew near to Ellen White. Lord, we pray for this blessing, and pray this in Jesus' name, amen.